Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Um, you may have noticed I'm wearing my monkey suit today, so I've been asked about that. Um, if you didn't, or, if you did or didn't hear, there was an investiture ceremony on campus today, which is where UVM gives a few of its faculty members an endowed position, uh, which sounds like a fancy job promotion. Um, so I was the lucky person today and got a nice medal, and I got five thousand dollars a year to use for my research. And I had to give a very embarrassing acceptance speech. So I thanked a lot of people, including my undergraduates. Um, around November, I'm going to be traveling to a conference in Germany, so I won't be here. There'll be uh, a guest speaker. And I will use some of my uh, invested position to bring you back fancy German chocolate. Ooh. Sound like a deal? All right. OK. OK. That's all I Thank you very much. That's all I want to say about that. OK. Back to much more exciting things, human-computer interaction. Um, any questions about Deliverable 3? I mentioned last time that it's long, it's 12 pages, 45 steps, but hopefully they're mostly digestible steps. And thank goodness there isn't much you need to do in terms of installation, right? Uh, there was a quick question just about um, a lot of the steps actually require you to make a change to the code that has no change, in the, that causes no change in functionality of your overall system, right? So it's not a bug. This is just helping you get in the practice of good software engineering. Add a small piece and make sure that you didn't break anything that was already working, right? Run your code and make sure it behaves as it did before. You'll see a lot of those uh, in here. So that's, that's what that means. Any other questions about Deliverable 3? No? We're good? Okay. So um, we're, working our, we're still working our way through the design segment of the course. Uh, we finally managed to get through uh, lecture slide six, where we were talking about some of the particular challenges when you're trying to create particular visualizations of things that physically exist in the world, so they already have some spatial distribution that you want to preserve in a map. Or they're conceptual things that don't have any physical counterpart. Or they may be things that change over time, and you want to try and represent them as a static image. You might want to try and allow your user to figure out cause and effect among the data that you're showing. So sort of a hodgepodge of different approaches, which fits within the larger HCI goal of putting the person first. Right? Their goals, uh, what they want to get done is probably not be completely overwhelmed by your fancy visualization. Right? They're looking at your visualization because they're trying to get something done. They're trying to be entertained. There's something that they want to do. Make sure you think about that carefully as you think about how to visualize the data you want to present to them. Right? OK, so that was a little bit of sort of a, a, an intermission. We're going to come back now to HCI design in general. And let's pick up with lecture seven. Actually, the last slide on lecture six, there was a little bit of an in-class exercise. You can try that uh, on your own. We're a little bit behind, so I want to move on to lecture seven if I can find it. OK, here we go. OK, uh, we talked about this before. Uh, we want to try and support our users. They're indicating there's something they'd like to get done, but they don't have software to do it, or the software they have at the moment is clunky. So how do we go from a frustration or something they want to get done all the way through to not just a nice piece of software that allows them to get done what they want to get done, but something that they prefer to use. There's something aesthetic. There's something that's enjoyable about working with your system. Um, these intangibles, right? This is the important part of HCI. Because of those intangibles, we put user testing or evaluation in the center of the design process. In software engineering, if the user isn't a big part of the overall system, you're usually, it's more sequential. Uh, design the system, write the requirements, figure out how many objects and classes you have, now actually write the, the code, debug the code, then deploy and do kind of user testing at the end. Right? That's probably been your experience in writing code in, in classes here at UVM. Right? Write your code, debug it, make sure it works, and then try it out on your friends. So in HCI, things are kind of reversed. What is the earliest we can get our idea, whatever that is, in front of our users? And what feedback do we get back from the users to figure out, are we on the right track? Right? The worst thing you want to do is spend a huge amount of time coding up a beautiful interface that's got, gets lots of, got lots of functionality, and nobody knows how to use it, or no one wants to figure out how to use it. Right? You're going to have an experience. You're going to have the opportunity to try this in this class. You'll be amazed about the things that you overlooked. Right? 
oh, I'm, the user's probably going to get stuck stuck on step seven. They never get past step one. There's something that you missed in the assumption of designing the system. Okay. So we're going to talk about each of these little rectangles in turn in today's lecture and lecture uh, eight. And we generally in HCI try and break things into these four different boxes. So requirements, we've already talked about that. What should and shouldn't the system do? So these are normally known as functional requirements because we're focusing on the specific functionality. Our system should display data that changes over time in a static image. We're talking about what it should and shouldn't uh, do. Envisionment is this idea we're going to talk about in a moment about trying to make ideas visible. So in HCI, you often create very simple software prototypes. Um, if it's something that has a physical component like uh, Leap Motion or Google Glass, you might actually make simple physical models, maybe even just mock them up out of cardboard. Um, you sketch out scenarios, where and when and by whom might the system be used, uh, sketches and storyboards all the kinds of e things that are easy and quick to make that we can show to the user and the user says, this is all wrong. Everything that's pointing to the left should be pointing to the right. Better you figure out those things early before you sit down and write hundreds or thousands of lines uh, of code. Conceptual, if you go out and work in industry, you'll hear about conceptual design and physical design. Again, this is design, so these aren't clearly separated things. But conceptual de design is usually trying not to think about the system itself, but everything else, right? We've already talked about uh, packed analysis. Who is going to use it? Um, what other pieces of software or hardware is our system going to talk to? We're not focusing on the how of the system. What is it going to look like and how is it going to, to operate? So the who in red there is probably missing from your, your slides. Physical design is how things are actually going to work in the look and feel. So ob obviously this overlaps quite a bit with, with prototypes does not overlap too much often with requirements. Now remember, requirements is what should the system do and what shouldn't it do. Physical design is here's a possible physical design that gives you the functions that are mentioned in, gives you the functionality that's mentioned in, in requirements. Okay, let's start by talking about scenarios, which is usually where things start with HCI design. So scenarios are usually a set of stories, and usually this is people complaining. It's so difficult to use the software. I'm trying to do X, and I do it with this system, but it takes me 17 steps. I wish there was a better way, right? Um, I know we have some UVM staff members that are here. Uh, UVM is in the process of bringing in a whole new calendaring system. Have you guys heard about this? Okay, you will. Um, what do you need in the calendaring system, right? It seems like a no-brainer. Why do we have to replace the entire calendaring system used by staff and administration at UVM? Turns out that even something as simple as a calendaring software is kind of tricky because you have a lot of different kinds of people using it. Some people on campus have very, very small uh, holes of free time in their schedule. Some don't. Some people are on campus. Some are off. How do you actually figure out, for example, how to find a time for people to meet? There's, there's a scenario or there's a complaint right there. It seems trivial, right? Okay, create a, an interface that highlights overlapping free periods of time. Done. You're all budding HCI designers. You should see there's already a flaw in this plan. We're going to deploy a new calendaring system at UVM. Administrators, staff, faculty, we're all trying to arrange meetings and find a common place to meet. Very, very difficult to do. All right, I'm, a, I'm an HCI designer. I can create a simple calendaring program for you that just shows where people's time, over, it finds over, overlapping places where people have free time. Schedule the meeting there. Done. It's easy. What's missing? A meeting place is missing. Okay, what else? So this person is, is off campus on, on business. This person is on campus. Doesn't matter if their times overlap. They're not. You're not going to get them together physically. So maybe we Skype the meeting. What else is missing here? How do we know that there are gaps in their schedule to begin with? This is the hardest part about calendaring systems. That's why UVM and other institutions are always trying to change them and find the next best thing. The problem isn't really with the software itself. 
with the people putting their times in. I don't know how many emails I've got about, use this new calendaring system. It's really easy. Just spend an hour at the beginning of your day putting in all, your, all the things you're going to be doing at half hour increments. Right? We should schedule time to learn to use the new scheduling system that UVM makes us use. OK, again, simple example, right? but this is about acceptability. Am I willing to put all of my time uh, online for everyone else to see? Think about political context here as well. Why, aside from the time it takes me to do that, why else might I resist? They know how much you're working, right? So you could easily do some early evaluation with the calendaring system where you get a bunch of people together and say, okay, go to it, put in your time. The first question you're probably going to get is somebody saying, can everybody else see my schedule? Right? It, it matters. Okay. So we're going, to we're going to sort of uh, unpack scenarios here into four different kinds uh, of scenarios. And we're going to start with these user stories. I wish I could do this. It's super hard to find a time for people uh, to meet. OK, I wish I could do x. So usually you start to hear these stories, or you bring together stories from a demographic and say, there's a common identified need here. There's an opportunity in the market. Maybe I can create a simple software system that will meet this common need X for, for this group. In scenarios, you're usually moving through st uh, scenarios that become increasingly detailed. And as you go, you're usually alternating abstraction and compression, which is what my little cartoon is showing here, and then generating alternative options and picking one of those options and compressing a bit. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So you collect a whole bunch of user stories from a whole lot of different people that have almost exactly the same need X. Obviously among that large set of stories or frustrations, you're going to hear lots of details that are irrelevant. Some of the differences you're going to hear are important. What are some of the differences with Leap Motion that are important? With Leap Motion we're usually talking about physical human differences. Lefties and righties, right? That, that matters. What's an irrelevant difference for lead motion? Gender. Gender. Now, it might, depending on size, right? But probably not. As long as we're doing something that collects a, a different sized hands, maybe gender's not too important. Maybe it is. Who knows? Pam? I don't know, right? Could, could be. This is exactly what you're doing when you collect a whole bunch of stories from people saying, you know, I wish there was a wireless mouse where I could just do something. Now, I wish I could just show the computer in 3D what I want it to do. The mouse and the keyboard's not quite a good interface for what I want to do. I wish there was something where I could just, right? So you create a leap motion prototype and then test it in the middle or evaluate it with a whole bunch of different people and start to think about what are the differences that matter, right? Lefties are having a hard time. People that wear jewelry are having a hard time. Doesn't seem to be a statistically significant difference between men and women. Okay, there's, there's an irrelevancy. So now we can start to sit down and in conceptual scenarios start to talk about users will be able to do X. We're starting to sketch in some details of what the system will, will actually do. We might generate uh, in this conceptual scenarios Again, the packed part of it, right? Users should be able to do this. Righties and lefties should be able to use the system and have an equal level of difficulty in, in using it. So we're sketching all of those. And then when we have all of those conceptual scenarios, now we might start to think about the actual hardware and software that supports the functionality and the people and activities and context that we sketched out here. So here's P, A, and C. Here we might generate T1, T2, through Tn, n different technological solutions to the P and the A and the C that we've identified here. Right? Okay. In each one of those n technological solutions, those concrete scenarios, now we start to get into the details of the technology itself. The user will be able to perform function X using component Y, and component Y will have this shape, and it'll sit on her desk, and she will hover her hand over it, and so on, and so forth. OK. Sketch out a whole bunch of those variations. And again, take each of those technological solutions, maybe build a prototype of each of those technological solutions, try them out 
with our users and see which ones work. Why did users tend to prefer our third technological solution over our first one? As we do that, then we might start to narrow in on our particular scenario, or a particular solution. This is the technology that really seems to support our users doing X. And we, we uh, converge on that. And usually at this point, we start to sketch out scenarios that are use cases. So the thing that's concrete across all of these is that they're all really stories. User, users X, uh, user wishes they could do X, then Y, then Z. We already have a story uh, in the for, far left. Conceptual stories, the user will be able to do X, and then Y, and then Z. Still a story. Concrete scenarios, user will be able to do X using component Y within five seconds. We still have a story. And finally, in use cases, this is something you hear, that you hear quite a lot in industry. This is a very specific story. User A sits down at their laptop, they log in uh, with their name and password, they wait between two and four seconds, the next page comes up, um, they fill in some data, that data is sent to actor C, another user, that user then takes that data and dot, 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 away we go. Okay, so along the way we're, we're sketching out these stories that are ultimately at the end giving us a very detailed technological solution for, for identified users. Okay, so let's, let's see a cartoon example of this. We collect two user stories. I'm a female atmospheric scientist, and I troll uh, three scientific journals for atmospheric data from the Amazon rainforest. I type in the data that I find in the tables of the paper and place colored pins into a map of the rainforest on the wall of my office. The color of the pin indicates whether the, uh, when the data was collected and what data it represents. Uh, I'm frustrated by the lack of real-time data, right? You feel bad for this scientist. Everything's being done manually. Hopefully we can find a way to automate aspects of this process. Okay. Uh, I'm a male high school teacher and I try and impress upon my students the effects of deforestation. I tell them the statistics about how much rainforest is disappearing per day and what effect that's having on the region and the world. Students, not surprisingly, like anyone else, doesn't seem to respond much to numbers and words but they do to images and video. Okay, so we're gonna take these two user stories and we're gonna, we're gonna walk them from left to right all the way to use cases and for the sake of today's argument, we're gonna assume we're gonna try and create a system that supports both of these users. Okay, given only that, what are some of the differences and irrelevancies that we can throw away? What are some commonalities in their need that we wanna preserve and boil down into a conceptual scenario. Let's start with the irrelevancies. That's usually easier. So given these two stories, we're gonna create a combined hardware and software system to support these two users. What's probably gonna be irrelevant about them when we get to the final system? Probably, hopefully this won't matter, right? So let's at least try and remove that. One's a teacher, one's a scientist. Might, might matter, right? I don't know. It's, again, it depends on what exactly does the scientist want to see and what exactly does the high school teacher want the students to see to really understand what's going on in the, the rainforest. So maybe that one's a little, a little trickier. What else? What are some other irrelevancies? Could, yeah, who cares what journals they're, they're looking at? They tell us enough about what the data is, but again, maybe not. This is part of the thing that's tricky, right? At this early stage of starting to think about the P of our packed analysis, it might be hard to say what's irrelevant and what's, what's not. What are some obvious commonalities? What is a commonly identified need across these two users that we're definitely gonna have to support with our system? Yes. Um, they want like, visual representations. They want visual representations, right? We just finished a section on visual design, right? If you're showing them tables of numbers, forget it. Okay. Would Gapminder be okay? I don't know, right? Again, we'd have to do some testing with our users. Would an average high school student with the right instruction be able to be impacted by a Gapminder representation? I don't know. Does Gapminder give enough data? Does it give enough hard information? 
for the scientist to be useful to the scientist. Who, who knows, right? But just raw numbers, that, that end of the spectrum is probably not appropriate. OK. All right, let's move on. Let's assume that we've abstracted away some of these differences and we've tried to identify some of the commonalities. And we're now going to talk about a conceptual scenario. Now, there's a few mentions of specific technology in here, a website. But we're doing our best to talk as little as we can in a conceptual scenario about the technology it's itself and just what the user is benefiting from. Users log into a website that provides dis distributed real-time data from the Amazon rainforest. The data will be collected automatically from different sources and integrated into a common format. The data will then be presented in a variety of ways, plural. Several of the visualizations will include animations as well as photographs of situations on the ground. If the high school students or maybe even the scientists can't actually see where is the data coming from, what time of day, where, where is this, there's something that's, that's missing. So conceptual scenarios, if they're written well, start to clarify the requirements of the system. Right? What must the interactive system allow the users to do? We're collecting data in real time. If we're going to the effort of collecting data in real time, that assumes that maybe there's a real time video feed or something that our users want to watch. Why are we bothering collecting things in real time if we're not going to display it in, in real time? Okay. Conceptual scenarios point the way towards multiple design possibilities, right? So we compressed from two user stories down to one conceptual scenario. And now we want to try and expand again and generate a couple of different concrete scenarios that support this idea. OK, let's try for a couple minutes to do that. What are some different ways, different kinds of technologies that would support this functionality? We want to collect data in real time. But we haven't said how. What might be some different technological solutions that allows us to do that? OK, sensors. So what kind of sensors? Satellite. satellite, right? So again, it depends on our budget. But you may get access to a real-time satellite feed from at least some part of the Amazon. The moment we start talking about satellites, which is a kind of sensor, that should immediately start you thinking differently about all the other pieces of the system, right? So satellites would be one concrete scenario. This is going to be space-based uh, observation. What would be a separate concrete scenario that might take you down a different path? How else other than satellites could we get real-time data? OK, yep, so we're going to actually try and embed sensors in, in the place where we want to collect data. But again, that should now start you thinking along a different path. So that's concrete scenario B. We actually saw that example a few weeks back. What are some additional details now that you need to think about if you're going to think about deploying sensors directly into the rainforest? Absolutely, right? Are you putting them on the ground? Are you putting them in the canopy? Who's putting them there? Uh, are we going to do this with people? Are we going to do this with drones? How are we going to do this, right? Uh, immediately now, we've got two very different solutions. We start to sketch in those details, given our budget, given our users. Do we have access to stakeholders, people who might not actually see the data, but manually deploy the sensors in, in the field, right? So now our packed analysis has changed. Now we're starting to think about stakeholders. People who help with the system but don't benefit, help build the system but don't benefit from it. Who is operating the satellite? Who do we have to pay? Do we, is, do we have to give commands daily about where the satellite should look? Or are we passively pulling down a feed from, from a satel satellite? OK. OK. So uh, I had two different concrete scenarios, one in which data is collected automatically, and another one where data is collected manually. So you actually have people tromping out into the rainforest once a day or once a week. 
uh, to collect data. We've had to, we've had to abandon our real-time data collection in that concrete scenario. So maybe that concrete scenario is not supporting details from our conceptual scenario, but, but there we go. Okay. So again, let's assume that we go with option two for a moment, that given our budget, we can't collect data auto automatically. Okay. So now, obviously, who are the actors who interacts with the system? We have this whole new group of stakeholders who are going to have to collect this data, data manually somehow. Okay. Now that we've decided on this concrete scenario, we boil it down into a very, very specific uh, use case. A government official uh, in this town receives an email or an automated message uh, that tells them where to go. Uh, they download that onto their phone, get in the truck, and go out into the field. Um, key in some of the data or record it from their phone when they're out there. That data is stored in a database. Um, after that's occurred, the researcher uh, uses this particular visualization, the educator uses this particular visualization, and so on. Right? It's still a story. Actor A does this, it's stored in this part of the system. Actor B does that, and away we go. And hopefully, in a use case, we have enough information that you could hand that use case off to a requirements engineer, which is an engineer specific who sits down and actually writes out all of the requirements that a design engineer or a software engineer then takes and turns into code and or engineers turn into to hardware. Okay, so in this cartoon example here, we just marched from the left to the right, but because we're going, we're going back to our uh, testers as we're going through this process, sometimes you move backwards towards the left and sometimes you make a decision and you move further to the right. When you're doing evaluation with your users, what might cause you to move back to the left? What information might come to light that causes you to have to back, back up and rewrite some of these stories or conceptual scenarios? Okay, absolutely, right? And this is what user testing is all about, misunderstanding. But what kind of misunderstanding is specific to what we've been talking about here? We have our user stories. They already told us what they want and who they are. Where might the misunderstandings have come from? What decisions did we make along the way as we marched from left to right? What to, what to abstract away, right? Oh, the fact that they're male or female, it's irrelevant, right? It doesn't matter. We've already seen examples of this with Leap Motion, right? There may be some assumption in the technology where suddenly that detail matters. Where if we do go with this technology, we're going to have to handle uh, those two situations differently. So maybe we should go back to the left and check our conceptual scenario or go back to the users and find out how many males and females are we supporting with this, this system. Are we going to have to have two different versions of our interface, one for scientists and one for educators? Or maybe they're going to use our system for basically the same thing. The scientist is going to use it to get a general picture of what's going on, and then she's still going to go back to her research journals for the actual hard data. Right? Maybe the fact that one is a scientist and one is an educator doesn't matter. You, as you saw when we started talking about these user stories, it's hard to know once you get, once you get going. Right? So you might have to readdress some of the assumptions you made about important or unimportant differences in your user population. Okay. So is a perceived difference, for example, researcher versus educator, an important detail, or is it an irrelevancy, or vice, vice versa? Alternatively, if you're moving forward, it's because you've been able to make a design decision, right? So you have a whole bunch of concrete scenarios, a bunch of different technological solutions, you make, so you make prototypes of all these technological solutions. You test them with your users. Everybody likes version C the best. OK, great. You can move on to use cases and start to work on the full system. Or alternatively, half the people like version A and half the people like version B. There's some, there's some difference, some unidentified difference in your population where they can't agree on the technological solutions back to user stories or back to conceptual scenarios and see if you can elicit that important uh, difference. So again, this is very important HCI design. It's not a simple matter of marching from 
an idea to the product, right? We're dealing with people, they're complicated, they're vague, they don't give us all the information. You need to keep going back, uh, back and forth. Okay, lecture seven, a very short uh, lecture, move on to lecture eight. Any questions about, uh, about scenarios? Okay. Okay, let's talk a little bit about prototyping. So we've collected these stories, we've sketched out a lot of what our hardware and or software might do. Let's make some things, let's make some prototypes. Um, a temptation when you're prototyping something is, I'm gonna write a, a, so a software prototype of my interface and it's only gonna be a thousand lines, not, not very big, right? Do you need to write a prototype that's a thousand lines? Can you take out a sheet of paper, sketch your web interface on it, and give that piece of paper to your users? It's amazing what you can learn from the cheapest possible prototype. So we want to usually try and keep our prototypes as simple as we can. As simple as we can that we can elicit things about our users that we didn't know before we started this process. And there are different cuts through the space of all possible prototypes that we can imagine. So one cut is simple to increasingly complex prototypes. So sketch out a, a web page on a piece of paper. Okay, we figured a few things out. Let me actually create a mock-up. I'm going to draw a detailed image which looks like a web page but isn't a web page. See how that goes. Okay, you like that? Now I'm going to make an actual, H, uh, an actual web page out of HTML but no active links. It's dead but at least it's, a, it's on a screen and so on, right? So we're marching from low fi meaning low fidelity, or doesn't really follow, it's not, it, it very crudely approximates what, what the final system is, up to high fi or high fidelity prototypes. So if you go and work in industry, you'll, you'll hear the low fi and high fi uh, bandied about. You may create a horizontal prototype or a vertical prototype. I'm gonna sketch out the eight uh, the eight main functions on a new smartphone and make sure that I got the right eight functions. Maybe it, be, it should be seven or nine. Or maybe I'm going to do a vertical prototype. We're going to add a new function to the next phone that people haven't really seen before. So we're just going to prototype how the user interacts with that new functionality and forget about the existing functionality for now. Uh, people who create great new products have usually tried to take different slices through this. They've created lots of different relatively simple prototypes and have found a lot of things that users like and dislike early on and then have plenty of time in the remaining time for the project to build those details in. You can go, you can spend a lot of time on a relatively complex prototype and realize that no one's ever going to use it. There's some basic assumption in that prototype that's doomed to failure back to the drawing board, right? The genius of good HCI design make a cheap inter a very cheap prototype where you find these details early. Okay, if you're working in a large software development team where some of the team is working on the interface and the other part of the team is working on the internals, which makes sense, right? You wanna separate interface from internals, so it may be better to even have different members of the development team working on these different pieces. Interface design usually runs ahead of design and implementation of the system's internals, right? We can play around with lo-fi prototypes and create an interface, assuming that the functionality already exists in the back end. In practice, it usually takes longer to create that functionality, that back end functionality, and debug it, which brings up a fundamental challenge if you're trying to evaluate prototypes. Maybe a relatively hi-fi prototype, so you're quite a ways down the, the design process. Uh, you've got a hi-fi prototype, but the back-end developers are far behind. They don't have that functionality yet. So how do you test a complex inter interface without the corresponding functionality? This is a, a, an always fundamental um, antagonism in interface design. All right, so let's see if we can find ways to tackle this. So like we just did for uh, scenarios, let's do the same thing now for prototypes. So simplest prototype is doing things with pen and paper. So create a storyboard. And in the storyboard, when you do it well, there should be little and, in theory, no text. No need to explain what the pieces of the story are. And this is a kind of cartoon example here. What is the concept that's trying to be illustrated in this storyboard? 
What's the affordance here? What kind of application might this be a storyboard for? Perhaps they haven't done a good job if you don't know. No ideas? Well, I thought it might be a drawing program. It looks like they're coloring something in. And they're drawing it through something. It looks almost like a car wash, right? Something's being sprayed on or added to this, this little star. There's an affordance there of something being put through a system and being colored or changed or filled in somehow. Uh, if, that, if this functionality was actually implemented in a drawing program, it might seem arbitrary, too complex, but who knows? OK. Um, we could start to just sketch these out on piece, separate pieces of paper and on a big desk take all these pieces of paper and start to move them around and attach them with arrows and actually sketch out in a few minutes how the functionality of this system might, might work. Okay, so we're going to actually try this in a moment. So for those of you that have pen and paper, uh, get ready. So imagine we're going to try and storyboard our uh, a Amazon rainforest uh, visualization system, the Amazon rainforest ecological data visualizer. So I want you to turn to your neighbor in a moment and with pen and paper sketch out a couple of pages where on each page you actually create one web page. So this is obviously very low fidelity, quick, cheap, and surprisingly effective. And sketch out a blob which corresponds to Brazil and you'll capture most of the, the rainforest. And then add around your blob, your map, widgets. Do you want slider bars? Do you want buttons? What should they do? Um, if you have text, just underscore it to indicate that it's a clickable link. Um, you might sketch on top of this uh, things that are bracketed with an H, which means it's not actually displayed on the page, but it will be displayed if somebody clicks a button or clicks this underlined uh, hyperlink and so on. So I want you to see within about three or four minutes uh, with a partner if you can sketch out a way to create an interface for our scientists and our uh, high school teachers. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Okay, do most people have something at least written down? <coughs> okay, all right. One of the nice things, obviously, about lo-fi prototypes is it doesn't take long to create one. To create one, right? You have a prototype of your website. The other nice thing about lo-fi prototypes is remember that in HCI we're always evaluating early and often. We're always coming back into the center of this star. So if you have a lo-fi prototype, user testing is also super simple. So for each pair, I want you to take your pen and paper prototype and hand it to the pair next to you and they'll give you yours and we're going to do user testing. Now user testing is even simpler when you get the prototype from the other pair. I want you to put a check next to everything you understand and a question mark next to everything you don't understand. And you're not allowed to talk, the two pairs are not allowed to talk to one another. No explaining. Did you say no text? You can you can have text in your prototype, but the user testing there's no text, just check or question mark, and then hand it back. Okay, this should only take a minute, literally a minute. Hesitate to give lots of question marks because you're probably going to get back lots of question marks. That's the point of user testing. Okay, if you haven't given back the prototype to the other pair, please do so. How did we do? Question mark, uh, check marks everywhere, no question marks? For those that gave out question marks, why did you give out question marks? Don't be shy, don't worry, you probably got some question marks of your own. What was not clear about your neighbor's prototype? Yes? Okay. So you weren't sure if you should assume that, right? So a line is a good start. But the affordances projected by a line are many, right? Is it a slider bar? Is it something that's clickable? What does a line mean? And again, this is a lo-fi prototype. I didn't give you a lot of time to sketch out the, the prototype, right? So a line with a circle on it and a couple of arrows, that's a slider bar, right? If you do this exercise over and over again, you get really good at interface shorthand, right? Drawing something and handing it to a user and they see it and they immediately know what all of the little squiggles on your prototype afford. What functionality do they, they suggest? That's a good one. Right? So there's something that's drawn, it's not clear what, it, what functionality it affords the users. Okay. Uh, if you go and work for a big design firm, most of the good ones will lock you in a room and you'll do this 20 times in a, in a row, right? 
We're only going to do this once, not to, not to worry. You can imagine, hopefully, you get a taste now of the amount of things that you can pull out of your, out of your users by doing this very, very quickly and iterating very, very often. OK. OK, I'll skip over this. Let's, let's hurry on. OK, Wizard of Oz prototypes are a lot of fun. Uh, as I mentioned, interface design usually runs ahead of back-end design. So you've just done this exercise quite a bit. Um, you've, pro you've actually mocked up a working interface, but there's no back-end. You've got a front-end without a back-end. What do you do? Well, you play the Wizard of Oz game, right? You remember the wizard that hide, hid behind the curtain? There wasn't really a lot of stuff going on back there. You set up uh, a user testing now. You set up a user testing uh, session now with your users. They sit down in front of a computer and they're actually using a live interface. When they click uh, on a link, something comes up. But what comes up was not provided by the user backend. It was brought up by the Wizard of Oz, which is you, the developer, sitting in another room, giving back a piece of data or a quick visualization or something that should be displayed to the, the users, right? So you're standing in for the back-end functionality which hasn't been developed uh, yet. Right? Um, it at least gives you a way to do some user testing with more complex uh, front-ends, but uh, it's difficult to evaluate timing, right? You're waiting on the wizard to give you, give you something back. And in good interface design, timing is usually a big, big part of things. Okay. Okay, maybe the wizard gets tired after a while, so you write simple scripts that gives back maybe dummy data. So it's not the actual data, but it actually gives you back a full visualization of some dummy data. You write a simple script, and you associate that script with this button, and another script with this slider bar, uh, and, and, and. So, and each one of those scripts is eventually going to be replaced by the back-end uh, functionality. There's a lot of tools out there. Some of these are, are dated now. But a lot of these tools were meant to be able to allow you to create sophisticated interfaces pretty quickly. You're not writing a full program. You're taking a sort of interface template and then hooking scripts uh, onto it. OK. And then obviously we get uh, to the full system itself, uh, and you deploy more user testing. OK. If you go and read your HCI textbook, you'll find that there are a lot of hidden assumptions in there that you're storyboarding screenfuls of two-dimensional data, right? So I've been talking about websites and web pages. I've already made lots of assumptions. You see this, then you click something, and now you see something else. But as we see in HCI, that, that's changing, right? How would you storyboard a leap motion interaction, right? Things are changing continuously uh, in real time. How would you storyboard Google Earth or Robot Lawnmower or Google Glass, right? It's a little bit more tricky to think about how to, to storyboard. So I'll leave that to you for you to, to think about. How do you prototype these things? It's relatively easy to create a static web page and then hang scripts off the back of it until the back-end functionality is there. Not so easy to do with something that's constantly in motion, right? Somebody's flying over Google Earth or somebody's wearing Google Glass and continuously moving. Okay. One of the research challenges in HCI is taking these design practices and adapting them for these new systems which aren't discrete screenfuls of data. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, prototyping is obviously a big part of it. In HCI, sometimes you're dealing with uh, software and hardware. Um, there's been a revolution over the last 10, 10 years which is collectively known as 3D printers, right? Creating a prototype has become uh, increasingly easy, right? So often now for new cell phones, they print out a thousand versions of your cell phone at very, very different physical dimensions, and then they ask people to hold it and do what they do with cell phones, right? In the old days, even just creating a physical prototype of something was a, was a labor-intensive process. You can print out a thousand cheap uh, plastic skeletons of something and see how people grab it and interact with it or wear it. Uh, it changes the game of prototyping. You can do more user evaluations more, more quickly. Right? Prototyping has become a lot uh, cheaper. Okay. So just as an aside, uh, I, I worked at a re in a research lab at Cornell where a lot of 3D printers got their start. Um, it was a robotics lab where they were actually trying to print 3D print robots. So in this picture here, 
Um, this was using an additive manufacturing 3D printer, meaning it adds layers of plastic uh, as it goes. It layers down some other support material that's eventually washed away to give you the final shape of uh, the robot. Uh, this was work done back in 2000, so they were just printing the plastic. I don't know if these videos will work. Let's see. Here's one of the robots they had from simulation um, back in 2000, and they wanted to actually uh, print this robot. So here's a sped up version of the 3D printer printing out one of the tubes that makes up uh, this robot. Here it is building the entire form of the robot in one, in one go. So they were playing around with different ways of how to print out a physical version of this virtual robot. Once they printed it out, as I mentioned, these were hollow plastic tubes. So they would snap in the batteries and motors and the other electronics that you, you need for a robot and see how it does in the wild, so to speak. Kind of feel sorry for this guy, right? Okay. Uh, the New York Times had an article about this work on the front page, uh, and it was machines making machines, right? The ultimate technological nightmare. Okay. I don't know if I'm quite afraid of that robot yet, but, but who knows? Okay. So that's just an aside, but prototyping has come a long way. All right. The main part of Lecture 7 and 8 that I want to focus on is evaluation. Right? We've talked a lot about user testing. What do we actually mean by it, and when user testing is done right, it's all about measurement. So you're going to do some user testing, and if you submit your final project with user questionnaires, and the user said, yeah, I kind of like this software, it was okay, but it was a little frustrating, your user testing failed, right? But what were they frustrated by? We want to try and make our, our user testing as quantitative as possible. We want to actually measure things. Okay. We're measuring things to see whether the system actually uh, satisfies requirements. Um, that is a golden, uh, that, that important rule is often broken in HCI. Often you'll throw your requirements out because the users say, yeah, I guess it's doing what it's supposed to do, but, it, but now that I've used your prototype a few times, I realize I don't really want to be doing X. I actually want to be doing Y. Right? This idea about going back and forth uh, during evaluation. Okay, evaluate early, often, and everything. So you already did some early user testing of a very lo-fi prototype, and hopefully it should have only taken you five minutes, right? If I did lock you in a room for an hour, you could get through uh, quite a few rounds of prototyping and, and testing. Evaluate early, often, and everything. Do that with not just the prototypes, but the requirements, and the scenarios, and the conceptual design, and the physical design. So maybe in the conceptual design, where you've written down your understanding of the people and their activities and the context in which they're going to carry out the activities. You show that list to your users and they say, wait a minute, you missed these people or this activity or this context. So there's ways you can evaluate things other than just the system or the prototype uh, itself. Right? Hopefully, uh, as you're becoming better programmers, you're doing a lot of internal evaluation, right? As you're writing and compiling and debugging and executing your code, you're watching it in the back of your mind. You're thinking, okay, I'm using it because I'm developing it. Will someone else ever want to use it? Am I going in a direction? Is my system becoming increasingly cryptic? I understand it because I'm developing it, but there's no way that someone's going to look at this and easily be able to, to figure it out. Okay. And obviously, we want to do some actual formal evaluation, which we're going to talk about uh, now. Okay, so let's talk about the evaluation process. So inside the overall design process, how do you actually care, carry out a round of evaluation or, or user testing? What are the aims of the evaluation? So what aspect of your system is being evaluated and why are you doing it at this point? And who is going to evaluate it? And what are the metrics you're going to use? What are the numbers you're actually going to record during user testing where those numbers will tell you whether, whether your prototype is on the right track uh, or not, right? So set out your goals first of all. The book talks about doing expert review first. What they mean here is review not of the prototype or the system itself, but the review of the evaluation process. So there are 
There are people out there, their job is to evaluate HCI evaluation processes. It becomes sort of a thing of infinite regress, right? So do you actually have a good plan? If you actually do pay 100 users to come into the lab and test your system, is there any chance you're going to learn anything? Maybe there's something fundamentally flawed in the way you're going to test uh, your system with your, your users. So that's what the experts are doing. Once you have the users actually coming, uh, coming in, recruit as wide a base as possible, do your testing, combine all the results from your users so you get a global picture, right? Did it work well for everyone? Did it work well for these people but not these people? What is different between these people and these people? And report that back to the designers, right? The designers should be able to get the uh, user evaluation form, read it off and say, oh, okay, I know exactly what to do. If you give them back uh, a document that says, these users kind of liked your system, how do they make your, how do they make it better, right? Okay, so let's start to talk first about uh, evaluation metrics. Um, we, there's, we can pick lots of different ones. Here I just picked the 12 non-functional requirements that we talked about a couple weeks ago, right? So these are things about the system, properties of the system that don't have anything to do with the specific functionality of the system. Okay. Think about these 12. If you do some user testing, what numbers would you record or what would you record from your users that would give you insight into how visible or how invisible the functions of your interface are? What data would you collect from your users to give you a, an idea whether your system is conceptually consistent with things they've seen before? What numbers would you record that would tell you that you, your users found your system familiar? If there are novel affordances built into your system, how would you know by the user interacting with your system that they understood those novel affordances? Okay. Take a couple minutes and turn to your neighbor and actually try and write that down next to these 12. Pick any ones you want. You've got some users. You're going to record data from your users. What data are you going to collect and how is it going to help you measure these 12 non-functional requirements? Yeah. 
you have like a number of places where you don't have to say that you know I have to draw that. Okay, we, uh, we could spend probably a lot of time on this slide. My humble opinion, this is one of the most important slides in the whole course, right? You could spend a lot of time coming up with dozens of metrics for each of these uh, dozen non-functional requirements. One of the most difficult things about HCI, and in my opinion, one of the most fun things, is taking things that are ineffable or vague and making them concrete, right? Could you capture a metric, something that if you measured it would tell you how conviv convivial your system is, right? That's kind of a vague concept. Very, very tricky to do, but if you do it well, you get a lot of information back very quickly from relatively few users and allows you to turn around your prototype and improve it and, uh, and roll out the next one. So good thing to do might be to take some time and actually sit down with the slide and really see how many of these metrics you're gonna enumerate. Okay, who wants to offer up some metrics for some of these non-functional requirements? Some of them are clearly easier to measure than others. Yes? I guess so like navigation. Yep. Take the number of clicks it took them to reach some goal point. Okay. Subtract the number of clicks that it takes to get there. Absolutely. So you could apply a topology to your system, right? We talked about navigation a little bit. Here's point A, here's point B. You know that the shortest path is A to here to here to here, three hops. But most of your users took six or 12 hops, right? There's something, you're not, you're not affording the, the paths through your system, right? They're not aware that those paths exist. Or they are, and for some reason they didn't, they didn't take them, right? They're not navigating through your system very well. They're getting from A to B, but it took them way more steps than they needed. That's a good one. What else? Yes? Um, like linearity to coming out of base, time it takes to complete something they previously done. Absolutely. Right? People that are familiar with the system will do things quite quickly. Right? Most people expect the search functionality, if there is one, to be at the top right of the page. Right? If they scroll up or go there immediately and type in their search query, good. Right? Imagine you put search in top left and you record the position of their cursor at every time step and you see that they scroll up or they drag up top right, slow down, waver, and then go over to the top left. You can do uh, cursor ballistic reports, right? Where did the cursor go? How fast? What was the curvature? That tells you a lot, right? If you don't have access to eye tracking software, following the cursor is a good, uh, is a good one. What else? What about affordances? This is always a fun one. Right? You're trying to present something on the screen, and you're hoping that what you presented on the screen advertises or affords to the user what the functionality is. Interact with me in this way, and I'll give you back this result. So. If you're trying to decide what would be unnatural, what would be an unnatural one? Some, like, you know, if they didn't normally go from here to here, you can have, right. you know that already. Okay, right, so you have an affordance, you have something that you're hoping advertises, remember we had the example of the chairs, right? All those pictures of the chair hopefully afforded to you sit on me, right? If they're not sitting on you, they're doing something else with the chair, they've misunderstood the affordance projected by that particular image. How would you know? That someone misinterpreted the affordance. They click on an icon that takes them to the next page, and they immediately click back. That might suggest right. That's right. They thought it was going to take them somewhere it didn't, and they had to reverse course. Right? You uh, you write uh, the first prototype for your ASL educational software with Leap Motion. You turn it on. Someone looks at your screen, sees your visualization, and puts your puts their hand over the lead motion device, right? Whatever your affordance was, it wasn't the right, the right one, 
right? Your user looks at the screen and immediately waves their hand about six inches above the centered above the device, right? Good. Could be easy. You show a video. That's that's important. Right? Is there something cheaper you could do to suggest what they should be doing? Yep. On a cell phone where um, someone's like trying to say point at me and they pretend that they're asking me like quiz questions. Okay. Right, so they're pointing at you. And but really they're videoing you the whole time. And and so and so a lot of the questions are really uncomfortable and it ends up being really Because you don't they're asking you interview questions and you don't know you're being videotaped? Yeah, you think you're reading the quiz questions and then you make all these funny faces because they're yeah. Oh I see. So it ends up being hysterical because they're supposed to be that. I so understand. my point is is that you misunderstand. Yeah, absolutely, right? You're, be, you're being taped, right? That obviously is, a, is an important one, right? Can you tell from what's going on? The little light comes on on your, your webcam. That's a pretty important affordance these, these days. Okay. Okay, so here's a few of mine. Again, um, you can use these or not. Uh, think of some yourself. Um, visibility, obviously, did they go Google it? So assuming you're capturing the entire screen, then you see that they opened up another tab or another page and went to go Google something, right? How many unexpected interaction results did you get? Now, there's a problem here because, again, what do you mean by unexpected? If you see somebody move the cursor somewhere, and then they pause and they don't click, and they immediately swoop somewhere else and they do click, that's it, right? That's a pretty good signature of an unexpected interaction result, or maybe confusion, uh, or who knows, right? Uh, again, items recognized from other software. That's a word, but we need numbers. What are you actually going to measure to know that they recognized something? How's my affordance there? This is my attempt to create a novel affordance. If that was on your screen, what would you do? Let's see how well I did. Okay. It looks like a fingerprint. Okay, so that's good. Then what? So hopefully this is running on some uh, touchable screen. Slide it down. Okay, Whew. took a little while, but it's actually a thumbprint, right? So maybe it matters whether it's the thumb or the finger. So that's my fault, right? My affordance isn't very good. If I had, if I did some user testing and some people were pressing and swiping with their index and some were pressing and swiping <laughs> with their thumb, what I meant, put your thumb here and swipe uh, 120 degrees uh, counterclockwise, I failed, right? But that's numeric. I can, assuming I can measure which finger they actually touched with and how much they rotated, I can quantify that. Maybe I go back and redraw that so it's clearer that it's a thumbprint, and on the next round of user testing, all my users immediately, my new users, who have never seen this affordance before, Of course, we want to do testing with multiple users, which means now we're going to enter statistics, right? So if for one of our metrics, so let's say we have a metric for feedback, so we see that everyone is scoring low, meaning uh, the users were not happy with the feedback they got. They got too little feedback or they got too much feedback. Whatever feedback we were giving to the users, it's pretty clear that our prototypers uh, should go back and work on the feedback. What's the results that you show to the user after they do something with your, your system? Everybody does well with whatever metric you have for recovery, or everybody does well with the new affordance. Everybody does, right? Okay, that's fine. You're good. The worst one is large variance. Some people did not do so well. Some people did, did better. So some people understood the constraint of your system. So you did some user testing with Leap Motion, and some people were going like this and eventually went like this. They kept their hand within the zone of detection by Leap Motion and scored high, so they understood the constraints. Other people didn't. They just kept doing this, and they were complaining that your system doesn't, doesn't work. What do you do when you get back results from user testing and you see high variance in one of your evaluation metrics? Was your sample big enough, right? Is this actually this high variance? Right. Yeah, exactly. Right, I've got three dots here. Maybe that's, that's not enough. What would you do? Go 
Is it, did you do it well? Maybe, you know, maybe it's the users that are the problem. Why, why this high variance? Where is it this variance coming from? What might be the cause of variance? Yep. Well, maybe like your software is not understandable for a certain type of user. Like someone who understands this technology more are able to like use these functions and others like they don't really understand because it wasn't very user friendly. Absolutely. So half your users have used uh, a Wii remote before and the other half haven't, right? They get the idea about finicky sensors, the others haven't. You definitely probably see some variance. So it might be your user's fault, meaning some of them have experiences that others don't. If I were to rate, if I were to give you a survey and say, how much did you enjoy installing all the software in Deliverable 1? <laughs> what kind of results might I get, get back, right? I'm pretty sure I'll probably be number seven then, right? <laughs> but assuming I saw high variance, is that because some of you are just way better at installing things than others? Maybe. Might be, might be you. What else might it be? I'm trying to get you guys off the hook here. <laughs> One end of the spectrum. Which spectrum? The question. I'm just saying the question you yep. asked. Yep. Then asked not right. Might have been. I might not have worded it. Did, did you enjoy install? Did you enjoy deliverable one? That might be my fault in the way I worded it. Yes. I think if you have high variance, there's got to be other factors. Absolutely right. So some of you have Windows machines. Some of you have Mac. Some of you already have Python installed on your machine. Some of you don't. Some of you have fast machines. Some of you have slow machines. Some of you are using the labs in Bodhi, some of you are using your own machines, right? There's huge variance in the physical context in which you were all trying to carry out deliverable one. My apologies, but that's, that's the way it is, right? Where is the variance coming from? Is that something that could be addressed? Yes? I could go back and rewrite deliverable one every year and say, if you're on a Mac, follow these instructions. If you're on a PC, follow these. If you're on the, right? Do a lot of work, right? Could do that, and hopefully improve that. Okay. A lot of the challenges uh, inherent in user testing, right? We're putting the user first. We're seeing how they use the system. We're not giving them a survey saying, how much did you like our software system, right? Measure lots of different things, hard data, and look at the statistics in your results to localize where the problems are in your system, and are they solvable? Or is this just an inherent thing you're going to have to deal with? Okay. I think uh, we're out of time and we're also out of slides. Perfect. Okay. Have a good weekend. Uh, there'll be a quiz. I, I'm sorry. I take that back. There will be no quiz tonight. I will send out an announcement on Blackboard. No office hours tonight. Um, deliverable 3 is due Monday night and Deliverable 4 will go live Monday at midnight. See you on Tuesday.